And I'm hoping that each one of these sort of builds on each other as far as a progression of material through the weekend. At least that's what I try to conceive of when we put these things together. We're going to have uh, Brother Dave Reed come from Columbus Bible Church in Columbus, Ohio. Dave is a great longtime friend, um, probably takes more phone calls from me than he would probably annoy him a lot, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, we talk quite regularly about different things related to the scriptures and the King James Bible and, and things along those lines. And so um, Dave is going to come, and our second study is going to be, I think we changed the name of this, to Dominion Theology, a Scriptural Evaluation of Post-Millennial Theology. So Dave, you want to come up and uh, bring the next study? Good evening, Saints. Uh, I do take a lot of calls from Brian, that is true. Um, but it's, most, it's, it's, it's all good, and here's why. What Brian does, if there's an old, long, boring book about the King James Bible, Brian can't help but read it. <laughs> and I don't want to read it, but he'll call me and he'll tell me the most interesting parts. So it's a fantastic relationship because I don't have to read any of these things. <laughs> And he'll tell me what I need to know. So he's like my cliff notes. So appreciate him very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, let me open us in a word of prayer and we'll begin. Lord, thank you for this time that we can spend together. We pray, Lord, that this time would be profitable. We pray the word would be clearly taught. Give us understanding and, and give us hearts to believe your word. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. So my topic tonight is Dominion Theology a scriptural evaluation of post-millennial theology. And I'll, I'll give you an outline of the four points that I want to cover. The first is Christian nationalism. We'll look at what that is. Second, we'll look at dominion theology and the seven mountain mandate. Third, we'll look at what is the correct millennial position. And fourth, we'll look at the dangers of dominion theology. So let's start with part number one, what is Christian nationalism? So what is Christian nationalism? So you're going to see a couple of slides here. You'll see at the bottom the sources. You can look these up for yourself if you want. I've taken multiple different sources for what I'm about to show you. So Christian nationalism, notice this, is a distinctive ideology that functions as a diagnosis. So look at this. The events of January 6th bolstered a growing belief that the alliance between Trump and his Christian supporters had become something more like a movement, a pro-Trump uprising with a distinctive ideology. This ideology is sometimes called Christian nationalism, a description that often functions as a diagnosis. Now, does that sound like Christian nationalism is a good thing or a bad thing? If it functions as a diagnosis, how happy are you when you get a diagnosis? It's typically not good news. So let's keep reading. This is from the same source. Now, notice this. There is no can canonical manifesto of Christian nationalism and no single definition of it. Now, I want you to notice something here. This is from the exact same article. So they first say it has a distinctive ideology. Well, if it's, if it's distinctive, it can be identified, it can be specified. But yet, what do they then concede? There's no single definition of it. Let's keep going. Christian nationalism is a seemingly infinitely malleable term that few understand. But its ubiquity and the charge it carries in the current political debate has made Christian nationalism a seemingly infinitely malleable term. Now, the previous slide, no single definition, this is a different source, it's a seemingly infinitely malleable term. As a result, few people actually understand what Christian nationalism is. Let's keep going. Christian nationalism is a label that people do not choose, but that is applied to them by others. The term Christian nationalism is relatively new, and its advocates generally do not use it of themselves. 
Now, what does that tell you about the term? It's not something people self-identify with. It's something that other people use to label you. Does that mean it's a charitable term? That it's a fair term or an accurate term? You know how labels work, don't you? Christian nationalism is a derogatory political term. Christian nationalism is most often employed as a derogatory term. It is crucial to realize that labels can be unfairly used to trigger an emotional response. Critics will often claim Christian nationalism when there is the slightest connection between a person's faith and his or her political or social views. At times, any politically conservative stance conflicting with progressive morality is waved away as Christian nationalism. So let's pull this all together. Based upon what we've just seen, Christian nationalism has no single definition. It's a seemingly infinitely malleable term. Few people understand what it means. It functions as a diagnosis. It's not a term that people generally apply to themselves, and it's most often employed as a derogatory term. So let me say this. Is Christian nationalism simply a meaningless propaganda label? Now I'm going to go back for just a minute. It doesn't have a single definition. It's infinitely malleable. How does that function as an actual term if you're trying to have a discussion? Can you have an intelligent discussion if there's not even agreement as to what words mean? So let me go back here just for a minute. This is a quote from Noam Chomsky. That's the whole point of good propaganda. You want to create a slogan that nobody's going to be against and everybody's going to be for. Nobody knows what it means. Why is that? Because it doesn't mean anything. And that's what Christian nationalism, but rather being favorable propaganda, what is it? It's slanderous. It's unfavorable propaganda because it has no definition, but it just connotes the meaning that you should be against it because it's a derogatory political term. Now, now Brian, in the earlier session, uh, was talking about language, and we live in a time where words don't mean what they normally mean, apparently. So I want to I quote an expert on this. His name is Humpty Dumpty. You may be familiar with him. This is from Through the Looking Glass. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in rather a scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master? That's all. So I'll just suggest this to you. People that can control the meaning of what words mean control the debate control the discussion. And so, I, and, I, and I don't know that, and I'll, this is a disclaimer for the whole weekend, I don't know that Brian's going to agree with anything I say or not, so hold me accountable and not him for anything I say. But when you think of the term Christian nationalism, what I have concluded is that it's a meaningless term. It doesn't have a precise definition. It's a derogatory term that people don't claim for themselves that others label them with. And what it is, is it's simply a form of propaganda. It's a way of, of communicating these people or these viewpoints are wrong and you should reject them. So that's what I wanted to say about Christian nationalism. I, I think it's a bad term to use because of, it's, it's a term that is ill-defined. It doesn't have a precise definition. So with that, let's talk about dominion theology. Dominion theology does have a precise definition. So let's look at this. The goal of dominion theology is to establish the kingdom of God on earth. In simple terms, dominion theology is the idea that Christian believers are called to not only preach the gospel and win converts to Christ, but also to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Now, Brian just closed his message with making the point that the single most important thing 
that the body of Christ needs to be doing is the ministry of reconciliation. We need to be preaching the gospel so that people get saved. If you notice the definition of dominion theology, it's, it's sort of the opposite of that, isn't it? Because what it says there is that what Christian believers are called to do is not only preach the gospel and win converts, but also to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Now what I'm going to suggest to you is that dominion theology adherents, dominion theology believers, are attempting to do things they cannot possibly do. I read to you on the prior slide the first quote, but I want you to notice what the, the, this work, Treating Dominion Theology, then immediately says. Bill encourages all believers to learn how to walk in the full authority of the gospel. Can you guess what's coming? So that they can heal the sick, raise the dead, and see people touched and transformed by the power of God. So we started with, under Dominion Theology's thinking, it's not just preaching the gospel, but it's also establishing the kingdom of God on earth. And now we see part of what that entails. If you're really walking in the fullness of what you should be doing, you should be healing the sick, raising the dead, and so on. And so I'll just make this point. You can't do that. I'm not going to spend the time to prove it, but you can't raise the dead. And it doesn't matter how much faith you have, and it doesn't matter how hard you work, it doesn't matter how much you try, you simply can't. And so for that reason, I'll just simply put it this way, dominion theology is attempting to do things that it has no ability to accomplish. There's no way it will ever accomplish it. It simply can't be done given what God is doing today. The ultimate goal of dominion theology is to transform society. Kingdom-oriented people must invade these mountains of influence in order for the transformation of society to take place. So what Dominion Theology fundamentally wants to do is they want to transform society. Can you transform society? Can you go out and fix the problems in society? So let's talk about the seven mountain mandate. And we're going to look here at the origin of it. In 1975, he, and that's a reference to Lauren Cunningham, he was the founder of, of the Youth with a Mission organization, he was praying about how to turn the world around for Jesus, and he saw seven areas. He said, I saw that we were to focus on these categories to turn around nations to God. I wrote them down and stuck the paper in my pocket. This was his list. One, church. Two, family. Three, education. Four, government and law. Five, media, television, radio, newspaper, internet. Six, arts, entertainment, sports. Seven, commerce, science, and technology. So the purpose of Dominion Theology is to transform society. The Seven Mountain Mandate, Lauren Cunningham, has this vision, and he has this list of seven mountains that need to be invaded, that need to be conquered, Taken, that need to be controlled for Jesus Christ. Now, now, notice what follows from this. The day after this revelation, so Lauren Cunningham has this revelation of the seven mountains, and look what happens the next day. The day after this revelation, he had a divine appointment. As he put it, I met with a dear brother, Dr. Bill Bright, leader of Campus Crusade for Christ. He shared with me how God had given him a message, and he felt he needed to share it with me. God had identified areas to concentrate on to turn the nations back to him. They were the same areas with different wording. Bill was stunned when I took the same notes out of my pocket and showed them to him. Just parenthetically, I was, I was saved when I was a junior in college through the ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ. And uh, really thankful for the organization and for the good work that they do. But let's talk about this for a minute. So Lauren Cunningham has this vision. He writes this down. The next day he meets with Bill Bright. Bill Bright had the same vision. And it must be God speaking to them and telling them that these seven mountains are what need to be invaded for the cause of Christ. I'll make of that what you will. This next here, this is Lance Walnall's articulation of the seven mountains. So 
Lauren Cunningham had his list of seven. Bill Bright had his list of seven with different words. Lance Well now is a leader in this, and so I'm giving you sort of his articulation of what the seven mountains are. The seven mountains revelation helps us strategically identify different aspects of society so that cultural transformation can become a manageable task. And you see the list of seven right there. Now, let's talk about dominionism just for a minute. So we've looked at dominion theology. We've looked at the seven mountain mandate. And I want, I want to just read you this quote to tie it together. The post-millennialism associated with Christian reconstructionism is often called dominionism. Citing the Great Commission in Matthew and the mandate to take dominion over the earth in Genesis, Christian reconstructionists assert that it is their God-given duty to exercise dominion and to bring all aspects of life under the authority of biblical law. One recent example of this is the Seven Mountain Mandate, which consolidates ideas about taking dominion and codifies them into seven mountains or spheres of society, namely family, religion, and so on. Now, what I've put at the bottom of this slide, let me tie this together, what I'm going to suggest to you is the Seven Mountain Mandate is simply a form of dominion theology, which is a form of Christian Reconstructionism, which is a form of post-millennialism. In other words, those are different ways of expressing the exact same concept. So when you're thinking of the Seven Mountain Mandate or Dominion Theology, etc., it is all about post-millennialism. So let me then talk about the correct millennial position. So the slide that I've put up there, there are essentially three different millennial views. Let's talk briefly about each of these, and let's look at what the Scripture says about which one of these is accurate. The first is amillennialism. An atheist is someone who is not a theist, right? When you put the letter A in front of a word, it denies it, right? So a theist believes in God. An atheist doesn't believe in God. So amillennialism believes, essentially, there is no millennialism. What they think happened is that there is not a literal, physical millennial kingdom on the earth. There is a figurative millennium, and in fact, you're living in it. Premillennialism, the pre is a reference to the second coming. If you are a premillennialist, you believe that the second coming of Jesus Christ occurs prior to the millennium. If you are a post-millennialist, you believe the second coming comes? More coffee, right? Post-millennialism, the second coming comes post or after the millennium. So let's just take a moment and get with me Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. And what I first want to show you is that amillennialism... Is, is just clearly scripturally wrong. Isaiah 2, verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In Isaiah 2, 3, the Lord is literally teaching man his law from Jerusalem. Verse 4, and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall bear, beat their swords into plowshares and their swords into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, so just to notice here, in the millennium, the nations go up to the mountain of the Lord to see him. The Lord teaches them, and they beat their swords into plowshares. So let me ask you this. Do you think you are living in the millennium today? I mean, isn't it painfully obvious that you're not? Get with me Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Revelation chapter 20. And verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit 
and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years." And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Now, what does the word millennium mean? Thousand. Guess how long the millennium is? A thousand years, right? So that's not really tricky. Well, think about amillennialism. If amillennialism is true, and the, the Lord's millennium, the Lord's kingdom, started at the cross, you have a big math problem, right? Right? Because you're approaching 2,000 years from that time. So amillennialism, just from a mathematical standpoint, is wrong. But, but let me just say this. Can anyone look out at the earth and say, it really looks like God's running things? I mean, isn't it obvious from how things are going that God's ruling in the hearts of men on earth today? Isn't that so just... Preposterous? I mean, it, it's very obvious that what we're... If, if this is the best that God's kingdom is, it's not so great. And of course, the, the answer simply is, we're not in the millennium. And, and our millennialism is plainly wrong. Now, during the millennium, the saints reign with Christ a thousand years, and obviously we're not, we're not reigning with him now. So, what that does, are you ready? Our millennialism <laughs> is wrong. So now let's talk about premillennialism and postmillennialism. And as you look at those two charts there, here's the, the, the issue. Does man establish the millennium and then Jesus Christ returns? Or does Jesus Christ himself establish it? See, if you look at postmillennialism, the millennium that reign occurs before Jesus Christ even comes to earth. Who does that? The UN? Like, what man-made organization is going to establish a reign of righteousness for a thousand years in the Lord's absence? Get with me Matthew 16, verse 28. Matthew 16 and verse 28. Matthew 16, 28. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see, now notice what it says here, the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. And what happens at the second Christ is Jesus Christ comes to do what? To establish His kingdom because He's the one that sets it up. Get Matthew 25, verse 31. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with, with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. That is obviously the second coming. Verse 32. And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In other words, what happens in verse 31 is Jesus Christ returns in, in his glory. And three verses later in, in verse 34, he ushers sheep into his kingdom. 
So did the kingdom exist for a thousand years before Jesus Christ returned? Or did Jesus Christ return and then admit people into his kingdom? And obviously what he did is he admitted people into his kingdom. Get Revelation 19, verse 11. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now that's obviously a reference to the Lord returning at the second coming. Now look at verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So the Lord first returns at the second coming, and then he rules over the nations with a rod of iron. Verse 16, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Look at verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and then that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now the point I want to establish, now that, that's Revelation 19. Revelation 20 has the millennium we just looked at. The very structure of Revelation tells you that the second coming is premillennial because the second coming is in Revelation 19 and the millennium is in Revelation 20. The millennium follows directly from the second coming. Now, the, the, the other point I'll just make on this, when you think about post-millennialism, the idea of the church ruling in righteousness for a thousand years and then the Lord returning, that is a naive and confused view of human nature. Man is never going to create the kingdom without God. It's simply not going to happen. And, and think about what happens at the second coming. When the second coming happens, how does the Lord's kingdom get established? Does it get established because they hold an election and he wins and he gets a majority of the vote and they say, okay, you get to be king? Does he win because the believing remnant during the tribulation conquers their enemies? What happens to his people right before the second coming? They're martyred, right? Many of them are killed, that ones that aren't killed flee into the wilderness and wait for him to return. Isn't that what happens? The way that the millennium is established, the way that Jesus Christ's kingdom is established, is by conquest. He returns and he kills everyone that doesn't think he should be king. It has nothing to do with man accomplishing it. So the, the post-millennial position, guess what? Let's see. We'll have to go to the next slide. The post-millennial position is wrong. So, the correct position is premillennialism. Now, let's go on to point number four, and this is the dangers of dominion theology. And, and I want to show you a slide here. This is... This is the, the viewpoint of dominion theology. And dominion the theologists view dispensationalism as escapism. Now, why do I say that? Premillennial dispensationalism, which if you're a grace believer, that's what you is. Premillennial dispensationalism is pessimistic in its outlook of creation and the role of the church in universal restoration. It promotes a form of escapist theology 
that leads believers to abandon the earth and its problems. While dispensational eschatology is hostile to the world, traditional evangelicalism has always pursued a missional eschatology that tied salvation and the work of the church to universal restoration. So here's what that's saying. Dominionists look at dispensationalists as escapists. They look at you as AWOL, absent without leave. In other words, they, they view you as lazy and indifferent. In other words, as the culture war rages, and is it raging? It is. And what dispensationalists do is they think about it from the standpoint of, well, our blessed hope is the rapture. And the way that we obtain victory over this earth is we leave, right? And the dominionists say, you lazy cowards. We're out here signing petitions, protesting. We're doing all this stuff because we're going to transform society. We're going to fix culture. We're going to invade the seven mountains. And yeah, it may be hard, but we're going to do it. And they look at the dispensational and say, you guys won't even help. You're useless. So they view you as escapist. They view you as having a negative view towards the world. And what that tells you is that dominionists actually think that they can usher in the Lord's kingdom. That in other words, they're going to invade these seven mountains. They're going to take control of them. So let me ask you this. Should dominionists be praised for their zeal or corrected for their error. See, that they look at you, why won't you guys help us? We got all the evil people messing up the culture, and you're, you're close to us, right? You're conservatives, you're biblical, you ought to agree with us and you ought to help. But you're just wasting all your time. You're, you're, you're too focused on things not of this earth, and you're not helpful to us in taking back society. Well, get with me 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. And I guess the question I'm asking is, do they have a point? Well, let's look. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away." For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The last days of the dispensation of grace are ruin, not revival. I mean, isn't that what it says? For dominion theology to be true... 2 Timothy 3 must be false. In other words, if they're going to invade the seven mountains and they're going to capture them and they're going to take dominion over them for Christ and they're going to establish a Christian reconstructionist kingdom, if they're actually going to do that, then 2 Timothy 3 is wrong. So guess which one is correct. I mean, if 2 Timothy 3 is correct, then dominion theology is attempting to do something that God has already told them is completely and utterly impossible. So is it really bravado? Is it really zeal? I mean, in other words, if you say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invade these seven mountains for Jesus. Isn't the Lord's viewpoint of that? I already told you, you're not going to do that. You, you can't win. Well, I'm going to do it because I'm, I'm tough and I'm not scared. You're unbiblical. It's not. 
Listen, if the entire body of Christ gets together and we all agree and we all vote that God's prophecies about the end of the dispensation of grace will not be fulfilled, guess what? It won't make any difference, right? If God has prophesied it, that's what is going to happen. So let me suggest this to you. Recycling cannot save the earth. Dominion theology is similarly ineffective. So if you see this slide there, it says recycling to save the earth. People have the idea, well, save the earth. Recycle, reduce, reuse. Do all these things to save the earth. What does 2 Peter 3 verse 10 say? But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. You know what elements are, the building blocks of all matter. The earth also, also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So let's say you got the whole world to reduce greenhouse gases. And you recycled everything you could possibly recycle. Guess what happens in the day of the Lord? God says, well, you know, I was going to destroy the earth, but since you recycled, I'm not going to. I mean, you can't save the earth. God's literally going to disintegrate it. It melts with a fervent heat. It doesn't matter how much you've recycled, it's not going to make any difference. I'm going to suggest you dominion theology is the same way. If, if your theology is the church is going to invade these mountains and take them back for Jesus, when God has already said in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, all those things are going to happen, and dominion theology is completely and utterly useless. It's wrong. It's contrary to the word of God. Get with me John 6 verse 11. John chapter 6 and verse 11. John 6 verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet, that should come into the world." So what you see here is the Lord is ministering to a large crowd. Obviously, he miraculously blesses the food to feed them. And what the crowd responds to that is they understand that Jesus Christ is that prophet. They have correctly understood who he is. So notice what happens in verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force, to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Now let's make sure we understand what's going on here. The crowd in verse 14 understood that he was that prophet. They understood who he was. And you know what they did? Well, obviously he should be king, right? If he's that prophet. And so the Lord perceives what they're going to do is they're going to come and they're going to make me a king. So did he say, great, that's exactly what I was hoping. Or did he withdraw himself because even if that sentiment was well-intentioned, it was contrary to the word of God? Was Jesus Christ going to establish his kingdom at the first coming? And the answer is no. So my, my point here is this. What dominion theology wants to do is the exact same thing that was going on in that passage. In other words, they understand that Jesus Christ is that prophet. They understand that he's the rightful king. Let's make him king. Doesn't that logically follow? Except the word of God would have told them had they paid attention to it. 
that that was not going to happen at that time. So when a dominion theologian says, well, Christ's kingdom needs to be established on earth. Yes, but not by you and not now. So when you're trying to do that which is not given to you to do, it's not spiritual. It's rebellion against the word of God. Get Romans 10, verse 17. Romans 10, verse 17. I know you know this verse. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Too many times what believers do is they operate on the basis of their own intentions and preferences and ideas, and all true faith has its origin in the word of God. So when you're acting contrary to the word of God, you are never acting by faith, no matter how well-intentioned you may think you are. Get with me Revelation 2, verse 17. Many years ago, before I understood right division, I was attending a charismatic church, and uh, the preacher got up one day, and he read Revelation 2.17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And so what the preacher did is he got up, and he told us by prophecy the name that was written on that stone. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, I don't know much. But it says that no man knoweth the name written on the stone, saving to whom it was given. So there's no way in the... It's literally impossible that he could be correct, right? For him to be correct, the verse would have to be wrong. So let me simply say this. When you disagree with the word of God, you are not anointed. You are not a prophetic voice. You are, in fact, carnal or apostate, right? Dominion theology has a 0% chance of accomplishing its goal of cultural transformation. But for the moment, let's just assume that they could. They have zero chance, but let's just for a moment assume that they could. So the body of Christ takes control of the seven mountains. Now, post-millennialists don't believe in a rapture, but Scripture teaches one. So what happens if the body of Christ actually takes control of all seven mountains? What's going to happen shortly after that? The rapture, and guess what? The body of Christ won't control anything at that point, right? So get with me Revelation 13, verse 3. Brian was in Revelation 13 earlier. Revelation 13, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. Now notice this. And all the world wondered after the beast. So dominion theology has zero chance of being successful. But if it did, and the body of Christ invaded all seven mountains and took control of all of them, which, by the way, we're not even close to doing, but if that happened, you know what would happen next? The body of Christ would leave the earth at the rapture, and who would be in charge of all seven mountains in short order? The beast! Because the whole world wonders after the beast. So is dominion theology, is Christian reconstructionism a good use of your time? No, you're not going to run anything. Are you an earthly people or a heavenly people? You've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Our conversation is in heaven. God has no intention of you running the earth and you're just simply not going to. Get with me 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And verse 1. 1 Timothy 4, 1. 
The, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now let's take that for what it literally says. So it says the latter times. So this is near the end of the dispensation of grace. And what is going to happen during that time? Some shall depart from the truth, which means they used to be in it, right? To depart from the truth, you have to be in it. And what do they do? They give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You can decide if this is true or not. Dominionists are themselves part of the problem because of their unsound doctrine departing from the word of God. The things that they want to do are unscriptural and they have no ability to do them. They are part of the departing from the truth. So let me give you this example, okay? You're in a burning house. It's a raging inferno. You have a squirt gun. And you can wander around the house, and there's enormous flames, and you can shoot them with your squirt gun. But you've got, you know, about a, you know, a pint of water in this squirt gun. The whole house is on fire. So if you want, you can walk around the house and shoot the flames with the squirt gun. Or what you can do is you can grab people and throw them out the window to a fireman that's going to catch them. Which should you do? You should save the people, right? Now, my point is, isn't that the situation you're in? I mean, in other words, if you perceive, if you look at the burning house that is society, and you think, with my squirt gun, I'm going to fix it, you're not accurately understanding the situation you're in. Because 2 Timothy 3 describes the spiritual character of the last days of the dispensation of grace. There's no fixing it. Wandering around with a squirt gun shooting flames is neither wise nor effective. It's self-indulgent. What you ought to do, since you're in this burning house and people are about to go into a burning lake of fire, is grab them and chuck them to safety. And that's what the ministry of reconciliation is, isn't it? You're plucking firebrands out of the fire with the gospel of Christ, telling them how to be saved, and they can avoid an eternal burning destination. So I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with this. As you think about some of the theologies that have, have grown in popularity during recent years, here are a couple things that I think have grown. One is Calvinism. Another is charismaticism. Another is dominionism. And what they all have in common is that none of them are true. Now, you read in, in 1 Timothy 4 that in, in, the, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. And so what happens is the body of Christ is departing from the faith. They're in the process of departing from the Word of God. And I'll just make this point in that connection. Um, as they depart from the faith... It is easier as a member of the body of Christ to go along with the current popular thinking because those things are trendy and popular. It's easier to go along with that than it is to hold to the word of God. But it is wiser and safer and better to hold to the truth irrespective of what others may do. And so we're living during a time where there's confusion, there's things like dominionism that are trying to control the structures of the earth, that are trying to take back power, supposedly in the name of Christ, but scripturally it's not something that they will be able to accomplish. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for its perfection. We pray, Lord, that we would come to a, a better understanding of it and that we would be busy about the ministry of reconciliation. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.
All right, thanks, Dave. Well, you've had a good night of study already, I believe. I trust that uh, you've gotten something out of both of those times. Just a couple brief announcements before we leave. We'll be back in this room tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Matt Hawley will bring his first message of the weekend titled, The Sermon on the Mount and Progressive Christianity. Then I will teach my second time at 1015 on Awake Thou That Sleepest, The Wokeism That Matters. And then Dave will teach a second time at 1130 tomorrow morning, providing for one's own, <clears throat> excuse me, the believer in the workplace. Then we're going to have uh, pizzas delivered for lunch. Uh, if you're going to be here for lunch, all we would ask if you would consider giving a $5 donation uh, to help the church with the cost of the pizza. We will also take up a small collection tomorrow morning to help with the expenses uh, related to the conference. If you're not going to be here and you wish to help with that, there's a box back here on the wall by the sound booth if uh, you're interested in that. Also, um, Dave, what time is church going to be open tomorrow morning? Do you think? Anybody? 6.30. If you want to come fellowship at 6.30, have at it, okay? Um, there will be some breakfast-type food out tomorrow morning before the 9 o'clock study. Um, so uh, please come and avail yourself of that if you're interested in that. Um, so I think we've had a, a great first night. If we'd all stand, and Ernie Skierbeck, would you mind closing us in a word of prayer?